I mentioned the twin study, um, which is one of your most recent uh, research projects. And can you share with us, a lot of people who are listening to this podcast or watching it on YouTube have watch the documentary. Can you, but for those of us, those folks who haven't, can you share with us the design of the study and the results of the twin study that was covered? Because, um, there, you know, there's been some, uh, controversy around, around it. Yeah. Uh, I'd be happy to discuss the design and a couple of criticisms that could be easy easily addressed. So the basic design is, it's a randomized dietary trial. It happened to be an identical twins, which was very unusual. I've never done it before. Identical twins are absolutely hilarious, but the two diet choices that they had to be willing to be part of, either way, whichever way the coin was flipped, was a vegan or an omnivorous diet. And I want to clarify just for kicks here, a healthy vegan and a healthy omnivorous diet. There's a lot of bad ways to do any diet and good ways, or better or worse, for any diet that you want to be on. And we're actually coming up with a side paper to address some comments we've had. So healthy eating index is a common metric in research that's been around for decades. And so we measured a healthy eating index score before they joined the study and when they were on the study. And so not only did the healthy vegans do well and better than they were eating before, but even the twins that got randomly assigned to the omni omnivorous diet, they were eating better than before the study, according to this healthy eating index score. Uh, part of the, an important part of the design was asking them to accept delivered food for four weeks. So that kind of makes them instantaneously adherent, especially because for those being randomized to vegan, I, I think a lot of them thought, so what is this? This is beans and rice and rabbit food and lettuce, right? That's all I'm eating for four weeks. And then, no, 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 we delivered about 50 different entrees to them so they could see the range of what was possible on a vegan diet. And after four weeks, they had to cook on their own for another four weeks. And at the beginning, in the middle, and the end, they had to give us blood and poop and fill out lots of questionnaires. Uh, super proud about the conduct of this study. So we had 22 pairs going in. Only one person dropped out of the study in the eight weeks. They were matched to the twins. So we actually couldn't use their twins data, which was kind of sad because their twin finished everything. But 21 out of 22 is fabulous in terms of retention in my world. And so when we looked at the metabolic risk factors, we had signed up on clinicaltrials.gov stating that LDL cholesterol was our primary outcome. And that dropped by about 15 milligrams per deciliter, more so in the vegans than the omnivores. We also saw a drop in insulin. We saw a drop in weight, uh, a decrease in trimethylamine oxide. Their biological clocks got a little bit younger. Their telomeres stayed a little bit longer if they were vegans. And that's probably a quick summary of all the things that went well. I did have a couple comments on diet B12 was down in the vegans. So we don't have any clinical outcomes from B12. That would take too long to, to wait for. But yes, when they were vegan, their B12 was down. Well, we know that. that we know that would happen, right? So you didn't really need to... And you didn't supplement. You chose not to supplement with them. Yeah. So I actually find there's enough foods that are fortified with B12 that you're probably okay. And that there was no... Even if they got no extra B12 for eight weeks there would have been no clinical harm at all to that. But that was like the, the only adverse thing that I can think of would be the B12. I was really fascinated by the telomeres part because I know from um, Dr. Dean Ornish's work and has been on the podcast and we went into a deep conversation on telomeres, that that was a relatively short period of time for telomeres to stay the same or lengthen. And at the beginning... Uh, Louis Facios, who directed it, was saying, we didn't think the telomeres would change at all. Like it was almost kind of this like, well, we're going to put them in there, but that's not probably going to, um, change is probably not going to happen. Tell me about, it, were you surprised? And what did you find out? I know they lengthened some, but, you know, which twins and was it a lot? And we didn't really get any specifics from Louis on the, uh, besides the fact that it was surprising <laughs> that they lengthened. 
So I was surprised also, and with these biological clocks that take advantage of epigenetic markers, there's a group called True Diagnostics that offered to do the biological clock. The telomeres were done at UCSF and totally surprised. I said, Louis, this is just a waste of money. There's just, it's not enough time to do this. I've looked at the literature. It takes longer than that. That particular paper is separate because there's so much detail in that. The one that we've published so far is all in cardiometabolic. There's actually two papers coming out. One will be very specific to the microbiome, and that won't be for an, another few months. But we've actually sent out the paper for the biological clocks and the telomeres. It's actually been pre-printed, and so people saw it already. And uh, we just got comments from reviewers back today, and we're working on it. So I, I can't actually specifically tell you which twins and how much, because we have to get into those details. But it was statistically significant, which was really surprising. Yes, I was surprised. And so our audience knows is that the uh, longer your telomeres, the longer your life, essentially. So preserving those telomeres can pres- lengthen your life. And the biological clocks, I mean, the same thing is like you have a chronological age and you have a metabolic age and the metabolic age is more important. How are you doing metabolically? What if you're old and active and fit and vibrant, then old isn't as important as vibrant. And could you also break down the, the, the cholesterol? You said the blood serum cholesterol. And did I hear you right? It was about 15 points different. Yeah, and there's actually a really subtle thing that didn't come up. So I I hope you and your readers can imagine that when you randomly assign people, one of the expectations is the two groups are equal at baseline because you randomly assigned them. But unless there's hundreds or thousands of people, it doesn't always work out. It turned out at baseline, the vegan group was at about 100 milligrams per deciliter, and the omnivore group was about 115. So they actually had, the vegans had less room for improvement, and yet they still went down about 15 milligrams per deciliter to 85, and the omnivores barely budged. So the difference, the chain, so the most sophisticated statistical way to do this is change versus change. Change of the omnivores versus change of the vegans. Part of what got lost in translation there was the vegans kind of had their work cut out for them because they were lower to begin with. So again, I was sort of doubly impressed with that change. 